Now on WCCO Voices. Our communities that have suffered most during the prohibition of cannabis and so we have worked really hard to try to make the social equity strong here so that our community can maybe even repair some of the damage that has been done but now it kind of seems like it's up in the air. It's callous when Republicans can only send thoughts and prayers and in action to American school children gunned down in schools here in our country. Uh, equally callous is when Democrats can only send thoughts and prayers and bombs to the children of Gaza. What's the exciting part about coming to see this movie? Oh, hearing it in Ojibwe. That's the most best part. I mean, you don't get to see watch a lot of shows that have Ojibwe or any kind of, well, any kind of indigenous language. So it's very exciting. Those are just a few of the Minnesotans we'll meet on this episode of WCCO's Voices. I'm Rich Chapman. Thanks for joining me as we explore the diverse voices of our community. We'll hear from the uncommitted voters with a message for the presidential candidates. But first, more than half the applications for cannabis business licenses are not from Minnesota. David Schumann talked with a local business owner about what she hopes to see happen next. Angela Dawson is done filling out her application for Minnesota's Office of Cannabis Management. A good 50 pages and a couple of meltdowns. I'm relieved to be done with the confusion. As CEO of Bold North, Angela is hoping to win a lottery for a business license pre-approval later this year. Not quite licenses yet, but enough to start planting seeds in the ground on a larger scale. She's one of nearly 600 applicants in her business category, competing for just 100 licenses. The stakes are high. Taking all the categories together, like cannabis retailer, wholesaler, or delivery service, there are more than 1,800 applicants crossing their fingers in the lottery. Less than half of those live in Minnesota. It really does make me concerned for that Minnesota craft industry that we've been so strongly trying to create here. A Minnesota statutes do not have a residency requirement, so we received uh, applications from all around the country. For Angela, it raises the specter of large out-of-state corporations snapping up licenses she feels should be going to local entrepreneurs like her. The OCM says limiting this first round of applicants to those who met social equity criteria likely filtered out companies like that. We're going to be going down to the individual level, looking at ownership. That's to make sure there aren't any large corporations that might be trying to sneak in. So now it's hurry up and wait for Angela, working to launch her business while also dealing with existential uncertainty. And I don't want to invest too much because I don't know if I'm going to have the license or not. David Schumann, WCCO News. As we get closer to Election Day, community leaders are working to get new Twin Cities voters engaged. I headed to an uptown Minneapolis barbershop to check out one grassroots effort. The buzz inside Lux Hair Salon in Uptown is not about haircuts and hairdos. It's all about voting. And because we're in the community, we want to be focused on issues that uh, affect our community, and voting is definitely one of them. Owner Maya Marshall feels helping the younger generation register to vote and understand the importance of exercising that right is key to stronger communities. We always complain about things happening to us. Why not be a part of the solution? And that is how you exercise your right. If you want to make any difference, it starts by voting. The League of Women Voters help to register young people. The decisions that you make now are going to affect us later. College freshman James King has never voted. This gathering is meant to ease people like him into the process. We need education to help us understand what's going on around us. Sample ballots help show what they can expect in the polling place. A panel of experts, including Attorney General Keith Ellison, on hand to answer any questions they may have. Young people always play this uh, amazingly dynamic and important role. They advance society. You've got to be there for them and listen to their voices. Event organizer Jerome Richardson says he is determined to meet people where they are to make them feel comfortable about civic engagement. So it's so important to me that we come to where my community is. We're in barber shops, we're in hair shops, we're in the black church, we're in the community, and we're in the basketball court. And so my goal is to bring voting to my community. A community that makes up a big voting block in upcoming elections and is determined to make sure their voices are heard. Not voting is not a protest. Not voting is a, is a surrender. Roger Chapman, WCCO News. Both parties are working hard to court these new voters. As Uba Ali explains, the Democratic ticket had a hard deadline from uncommitted delegates that could impact the outcome in states like Minnesota. With the Democratic National Convention behind us, the last leg of the race is on, but some Democratic delegates are holding out. The uncommitted national movement has set a deadline of September 15th for Vice President Harris to meet 
with Palestinian families to talk about how we can end this. End the war in Gaza or risk losing their support. Words aren't enough. Asma Mohammed, lead organizer of the grassroots organization, says an opportunity to unite the party was denied at the DNC. But the Harris campaign said that they did not want a Palestinian speaker on stage. They were missing an opportunity to tell voters that they cared. Leading to a sit-in hours before Harris took the stage with this message. President Biden and I are working to end this war such that Israel is secure, the hostages are released, the suffering in Gaza ends, and the Palestinian people can realize their right to dignity, security, freedom, and self-determination. We have heard for months and months that Vice President Harris and President Biden are working around the clock tirelessly for a ceasefire, and yet nothing has changed. Nearly 46,000 Minnesotans voted uncommitted on Super Tuesday. That's 19 percent of all DFL primary voters. Delegates believe that number could rise if there's not an end to violence in the Middle East. That we can make Vice President Harris commit to an arms embargo because I think that's the only way we can win. A line in the sand among delegates. To be clear, I'm voting for Democratic candidates in the fall, but I know folks who can't. With the White House on the line. Uba Ali, WCCO News. Election day is Tuesday, November 5th. To vote, you must be a U.S. citizen, be at least 18 years old on election day, and a resident of Minnesota for 20 days. As of this year, you can vote if you have been convicted of a felony, as long as you are not currently in prison, and you can register on election day with a state or tribal ID. Even as advertisements become more diverse, that's not always the case at the agencies who make those ads. Susan Elizabeth Littlefield shows us how some new college grads are working to change the game. Whether it's TV, print, or the palm of your hand, ads are everywhere. And this is where they're made. In this uh, presentation. A vibrant, yet not so diverse behind the scenes industry. This ad agency is working to buck the trend. It's important for us that the work we do is representative of not just one group of people, but a lot of different communities. Lorenz, whose family is from the Philippines, is the CEO of Minnesota-based Folklore. I was basically a child of immigrants, and um, at the end of the day, didn't really have an idea of what marketing and advertising uh, work was all about. So he's marketing the industry to Alma Keher and Jen, who are Folklore and Brand Lab's summer interns. Through this internship, we have more and more people who bring to the work of marketing and advertising the backgrounds, the lived experiences that allow them to say, here's the types of people that we should bring to these or hire for these commercials. Interns have been working hard on campaigns like this one from all of America, where more people from more backgrounds are included. It's really important to be able to relate to something before you really connect with it, especially when it comes to products. Is there a space in general that you think you'd really like to see yourself more represented? I guess I would say more like physical ads, like videos or pictures. So the recent U of M grad is working with another U of M grad to represent the inside of the industry and the work they output. Just more representation to people see that, you know, this is important, like we need to have more diversity. What's your dream? My dream is to have my own agency to inspire other people that look like me and just continue this movement of diversity and change and changing the voice and face of this industry. So now these motivated students are teaching the industry. I think at the end of the day, it allowed us to really basically open our hearts and minds to experiences that we personally didn't have before. And we're able to really basically incorporate their thoughts and their POVs in how we do our work which has been phenomenal in terms of the work that we were able to do. So it was success, it sounds like. Totally. <laughs> in St. Louis Park, Susan Elizabeth Littlefield, WCCO News. Summer camp season is over, but one local camp story is just beginning. Susan Elizabeth Littlefield takes us west of the metro to Watertown to the magical Camp Parsons. When it was time to come back in from lunches, this, this bell rang what to call doing? everybody to gather. For these four, this is memory lane. We'd all winter long 
for it to come alive. And then you pull up off the highway to the gate and you unlock the gate and it was just like entering a whole nother world. I was out here all of my childhood every summer um, learning to fish and camp and make fires. Learning to swim here, even though lots of leeches back then, but. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, so there were some downsides <laughs> in Camp Parsons. But not many. In 1956, Catherine Parsons gifted it to the Phyllis Wheatley Community Center so kids who live in the city could experience the country. It almost looks like a clover. The campground was abandoned around 20 years ago. We had the rowboats right here. But the bonds and the memories live on. When I saw all of the stars in the skies, I literally screamed because I had never seen that many stars in the skies before. It was overwhelming, the emotion that I was feeling. Tell me about that coat. Oh, this is my grandmother, Carrie Wallace. I bring her with me today. Um, this, see, I'm gonna start crying. <laughs> She had many hats she wore, and she um, helped so many kids. And now there's an effort to help more kids. Volunteers are fundraising to restore the place to its original glory. It belongs to the community, and that's so critical to me. Um, and it's essential that we bring it back. This time, we're gonna do it. Just want kids, especially from the north side, to be able to experience this be a kid at an almost perfect place. And she talked about the leeches, but they're forgiven too. <laughs> In Watertown with photojournalist Tom Avilis, Susan Elizabeth Littlefield, WCCO News. It will cost about $5 million to restore the place. If you'd like to help or learn more, there's a Restore Camp Parsons website. Still ahead on Voice is a new language heard a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It's very important. I mean, it's all part of our culture, all part of our traditions, all embedded with everything. I talked to some excited moviegoers about why a new version of Star Wars has them willing to put up with subtitles. And his mother raised a Minnesota icon, the big honor for mentor and mother of the Minneapolis Sound, next. Welcome back to Voices, a big honor for a North Minneapolis woman considered the mother of the Minneapolis sound. Bernadette Anderson raised a music legend you may have heard of, the one and only Prince, along with her own talented children. I stopped by their old home to talk with her son about his mother and the musical giants she nurtured. The basement of 1244 Russell Avenue North is considered the birthplace of the Minneapolis sound. This is where I used to sit, actually both me and Prince used to sit here and practice. It's where Andre Simone, bass player, songwriter, and music producer, grew up. It was such a um, joyful house, you know, I mean, music was always pumping through the house and kids were always running up and down. Andre says his mother, Bernadette Anderson, was happy to be a part of helping people realize their dream. Well, we jammed, obviously Prince came to live here. He lived here for, you know, from, I think, what, eighth grade to to when he got his record deal. <laughs> Bernadette Anderson also worked in the community. From Ruth Hawkins Center in North Commons Park to the Urban League Street Academy, she worked for more than 25 years advocating for young people. Uh, we won Family of the Year, the Urban League Family of the Year, uh, 1974. Her blended family included Prince and other members of what we now call founders of the Minneapolis Sound. Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, Morris Day all made this home on Russell Avenue North their creative place. I don't think a day goes by that I don't appreciate um, what my mother has been able to um, help us all achieve. She will now be honored with the renaming of Russell Avenue North to Bernadette Anderson Way, a great honor for a woman who grew up in foster care. She didn't want that, she didn't like that, you know, the feeling of abandonment. So I think that had a lot to do with her bringing kids into our home. Anderson would have her first child at 14, but eventually went on to get her GED and earn a bachelor's degree in public policy administration from the University of Minnesota. Andre hopes her life and legacy will be an inspiration to young women everywhere. If Bernadette Anderson, coming from where she came from, you know, going through all the different things that she went through, if she can do this, any one of y'all can do this. Reg Chapman, WCCO News. A wall-sized piece of art is getting an overdue makeover by its original painters. David Schumann shows us why the artists believe in a social media world, a real-world mural can still have power. For 39 years, Anyone driving this stretch of Robert Street in St. Paul has laid eyes on Hunger Has No Color, a mural depicting, 
Well, let the artists themselves tell it. It's actually talking about the community need, trying to prevent hunger in Minnesota. If we can prevent struggle and help humanity, we're trying to say that through this mural. Armando Gutierrez G., John Acosta, and Richard Schletti originally painted it in 1985 when the building was a food bank. Now all three are back, restoring and essentially repainting what decades out in the elements did to the mural. It's an honor and privilege to do this. You know, not many artists get to come back to their work. I've been seeing it deteriorate, and I mean, that kind of hurt to see it falling apart. The artists painted people in the neighborhood in the original, as well as members of their own family. And I think that that's the beauty of murals, is that they become part of a community that is broader than, uh, I don't know, 15 seconds of looking at a, a social media page or something. I think this one here is a real special one because um, it, it's, it has a story, it has a good message to it. It comes to more and more to life each day. It's uh, pretty incredible. The co-owners of Captain Ken's Foods have supportively watched the back of their building transformed the last two months. I think it's a really important piece for this time, and it's, it's amazing how many people are coming down to see it now. In St. Paul, David Schumann, WCCO News. Sci-fi has long helped us imagine new possibilities and break down racial barriers. That's what happened when Star Wars A New Hope became the first Hollywood movie translated into Ojibwe Moen. I talked with some excited fans at Marcus Theaters in Oakdale and found out how the movie is helping revitalize the Ojibwe language. It's a day when tradition and culture combine with the power of Hollywood. Star Wars A New Hope is the first movie ever to be translated into the Ojibwe language. Here in Ojibwe. That's the most best part. I mean, you don't get to see watch a lot of shows that have Ojibwe or any kind of, well, any kind of indigenous language. Kathy Staples Forletta is bringing her niece to witness history to see the first showing of the movie in their native language. Oh, it's very important. I mean, it's all part of our culture, all part of our traditions, all embedded with everything. For many, this film is a milestone in their journey to revitalize the language. The Lakota Ojibwe Tribal Council took, played a big part in getting this project started. They did a lot of the translation work and reached out to Lucasfilm with the project proposal. Calvin Hartwig is a language culture coordinator for the Red Cliff Tribe. He also gives voice to Red Leader, one of the characters in the movie. I hope this film inspires many people to either continue or begin learning Ojibwe Moan. Hartwig hopes a generation of moviegoers get excited about the translation of such a film into Ojibwe, breathing new life into an endangered language. We're really fortunate to have around 50 first language fluent speakers this side of the border. And now is the moment for folks to really get started on their Ojibwe language journey. For teens like Micah Moore, she is excited to be a part of history and to play a role in making sure to maintain, grow, and use the language of her people. Well, I learned it through elementary school to seventh grade. Um, and yeah, it kind of will push me to learn it more. Reg Chapman, WCCO News. As part of the recent Excel Energy Day of Service, we are highlighting local organizations that make a difference. Excel volunteers helped out at Clues, an organization that provides food, housing resources, English classes, and mental health services for Minnesotan Latinos. Jason Ransler found out how they're meeting a growing demand. Inside the Career Force building on East Lake Street in Minneapolis, employees with Latino advocacy organization Clues unpack boxes of food for those in need. Yeah, I'm ready to bring them in. Roughly 400 in need on this day alone lined up along the building. Un Every Wednesday, Clues holds its weekly food shelter, Canasta Familiar, providing fresh produce, healthy, culturally appropriate food, primarily for Latino families. It's a program that Minnesota's largest Latino nonprofit has hosted since COVID. And this year we have seen a tremendous need. Clues President Ruby Osorita Lee says it's a need that's doubled in the last year alone. Last year, Osorita Lee says Clues served roughly 200 families per week. That number has doubled to about 400 at their Minneapolis location alone. The reason... We have seen a, a huge influx of new arrivals. ...has to do with an influx of migrants seeking out a better life in Minnesota. In Minneapolis in particular, we have a large number of Ecuadorians living here, uh, but in the most recent years, in the last two, three years, we see a large influx of Venezuelans, Colombians, 
um, Ecuadorians too because family members are here. Asturita Lee says they couldn't do what they do without help from volunteers like Tanya Asturillo. An Ecuadorian immigrant sí, sí. and now food shelf volunteer. Why does she do it? El, el servir. So I can be in contact with my community. Asturillo is giving back to the food shelf that helped her get to where she is now, where she works in food service at a school in Minneapolis. Que lo haga. The best way to give back is to be a volunteer. Clues is seeking out more volunteers like Astudio okay. to continue to help out the Latino community for years to come. We are here to serve the Latino community, and as such, we welcome everyone who is a new arrival. In Minneapolis, Jason Rantala, WCCO News. Music, dancing, and good food welcome partiers at Fiesta Latina at the Clues location in St. Paul. Photojournalist Ari Mendoza takes us into those festivities. Feliz Mes de la Hispanidad. We are so excited. We're starting the celebrations throughout the next month. As Latinos, it is very important for us to celebrate. It is important to change the narratives and show the positive entrepreneurship and the building community that we have. A united Latino community that celebrates culture, celebrates community work. And uh, this is one of those. Fiesta Latina is celebrated by Clues. We are here celebrating our culture uh, as it is, you know, Hispanic Heritage Culture uh, Month. And so we're here just kind of, you know, indulging in all the activities. Yeah, and we're new to Minnesota, so this is a great way for us to find our community. So we try to have multi-generational activities for children to learn about their heritage, learn their language, and learn activities through art and culture. Ya gozar ya bailar. So. Laos is the home country of many Minnesotans, including prominent Twin City chef Anne Ahmed. She's preparing to lead a group of Minnesotans on the trip of a lifetime. Erin Hassan's going to talk to her about her inspiration for a culinary journey. It's a very spiritual place. It's an emerging country. The sights, sounds, and smells of Laos linger in Chef Anne Ahmed's mind. Every time I go to Laos, it's just an, you know, an overwhelming feeling of like just appreciation and just warmth and welcome. They inspire the James Beard Awarded Chef to bring bright, interesting flavors to her local restaurants, Kaluna, Gai Noi, and Lat 14. And now she's bringing more than a dozen Minnesotans along with her on a culinary journey back through her home country. It is just filled with so much culture, so much history, um, vibrancy in food and in, in experiences that you could have while you're traveling through there, but most importantly, the people. She said to me, we should go to Laos. And I was like, please take me to Laos. Local host and editor Stephanie March is joining the trip, bringing her curious foodie lens to the group. I'm not interested in just how something tastes, but like how it fits into like the culture and how, especially for Anne, why it's important to her to bring it to us. The pack of Minnesotans will eat their way through this 10 day journey through waterfalls, jungles, mountain villages and sequestered spots. My itinerary is based on food, and so it's kind of like where are we going to eat, how are we going to weave our experiences or places that we're going to visit. All of it designed by Chef Ahmed to showcase the people, places, and flavors that drive her. These trips that I've taken back to Laos really helped me to, to gain that identity that I have, and that's really a Laotian, Minnesotan American. Um, some of these items are inspired from the, the, the trip that we're going to be going on. Um, so I have a lot of jail. So the main focus is I'm going to be doing a class when we're in Laos, and we're going to make jail. So basically, jail is kind of like um, a Laotian hot sauce, and you can be it can be made with anything. Um, so we have to roasted tomato, roasted chilies, roasted eggplant, and like crispy fried catfish. Chef Ahmed shows off this beautiful bag. It's made out of um, jungle vines. So they make these thread out of the jungle vines that they harvested from the jungle. And then they will dye it and then they will weave it. And so they're incredibly strong and sturdy. Her guests will meet the artisans and spend time with them, learning the craft before bringing home meaningful souvenirs. That's an experience you just can't get any other way. That's a bucket list for sure. The trip of a lifetime going beyond the plate and into the heart 
of Laos. This is a personal journey. The excitement of wanting to share it is already a huge part of me going on this trip. This won't be the last. This, this won't will be, not the last. be the last. Once Minnesota Governor Tim Walz took to the big stage of the Democratic National Convention, it was his son Gus who stole the show. Gus has a nonverbal learning disorder and his visibility started a big conversation on neurodivergence. Susan Elizabeth Littlefield shows us how some are still feeling the Gus Walls effect. Good job, Ry. Whether it's stuffing envelopes or doing laundry, Riley has the hang of things around here. Good job, bud. He's one of the learners at the Minnesota Autism Center. The centers help give kids and teens who are neurodivergent a boost with social skills and job skills. You are neurodiverse if you fit into autism, ADHD, or anxiety disorder. The newest famous face of the community is Gus Walls. The governor's son grabbed spotlight after spotlight for his public affection for his dad. And what was it like for you just as a person to see neurodivergence on so many headlines? I mean, it brought a smile to my face of, you know, finally taking people that for so long and a community that for so long has been hidden out into the light and, and not just an average light, but a national and uh, honestly international stage. Jen helps run Mac, a place that's been extra busy the past three weeks. Would you say awareness shot up? Yeah, absolutely. There's more community conversation about it. I think there's more self-reflection. I know we've definitely seen um, you know, people reaching out to our organization and, and asking, can I get an assessment for this? And assessments, she says, are key, as they can lead to support and for Riley, results. He required a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention, really struggled in groups. And now? He went on a coffee date with one of his friends, and he was able to go up to the register and order his own coffee and bring it back to the table and sit with his peer at that table. How did it feel to hear that? Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone in that meeting just beamed and cried. I'm really sad you can do that. I'm so nice. You did set it up so nice. Good job. In Egan, Susan Elizabeth Littlefield, WCCO I'm News. I'm really sad you can do that too. Holy well. Mac now hopes business owners will be more open to hiring those who are neurodivergent as they can be standout employees. Still ahead, a Minnesota mom just bagged a cornhole world championship. What do you think it is about cornhole that resonates so much with the Hmong community? So back in the day when, um, back in the day as in my mother and father's livelihoods of growing up, they used to toss a ball during courtship. Meet Dia Lee and learn how the Minnesota Hmong Cornhole Club is propelling the sport in communities across the country next. Turning now to sports in this episode of Voices, a backyard sport took a Minnesota woman to the world stage. WCCL's Kirsten Mitchell introduces us to Dia Lee, the newest cornhole world champ. Inside the Minnesota National Guard Armory in Minneapolis, bags are flying and kids are playing. This is home for the Hmong Cornhole Club, the largest club in Minnesota, founded just three years ago. It is so crazy how big we've gotten. When we first started, we started about 15 people to 20, and then now we're averaging about 60 to 90. Alan Lee first discovered cornhole in Kuwait. I was first introduced by my squad leader back in 2007 when we were deployed. I was just like, what is this? He quickly learned anyone could play, so he shared it with his community back home. What do you think it is about cornhole that resonates so much with the Hmong community? Back in the day, as in my mother and father's livelihoods of growing up, they used to toss a ball during courtship. A lot of the elders who come and see this, they're like, oh, you guys, it's called uh, football. They're like, oh, you guys, are, it's sort of like football. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you, you can say that, you know. Oh, yes. I wasn't really good, but then I was like, you know, I, I want to be better. Dia Lee and her husband started playing three years ago and now competed tournaments across the country. I just would never fathom like our lives would be like how it is now. Because now the 38 year old mom of four is a world champion. She recently won the women's single title at the American Cornhole League's World Championship in South Carolina. I'm still kind of like, I really did do that. Like, that's insane. 
And then some days I look back and I'm like, I, re I really did do that. She says she couldn't have done it without her family and the Hmong community she proudly represents. It's just so phenomenal to see uh, like her accomplishment, uh, what it means to the Hmong community, what it means to the Minnesota community, yeah. the Minnesota Cornhole community itself. As a whole, we're also proud of her. Allen says the Hmong Cornhole Club welcomes people from all backgrounds to join. Regardless of your skill set, regardless of your age. So don't be afraid to get on board. In Minneapolis, Kirsten Mitchell, WCCO News. Congrats on a big win. Dia Lee begins her first season as a professional cornhole player this October. Maya Moore was as good as it gets during her eight-year run in the WNBA. Last year, she officially retired after being away from the game for five years. Now her number is in the rafters. Moore is a former MVP, six-time All-Star with four championships. You name it, she did it. You can see Maya get emotional as the Minnesota Lynx held a ceremony for the basketball legend. We took the opportunity to ask her what's next. So many of us don't live this life of being on planes and out of a suitcase where we do the hard work of just being a member of our community and of our family. And so I'm looking forward to actually taking the wonderful culture and lessons I've learned from being a pro and bringing that to my people that I actually know and do life with. We wish her happiness on that journey. Another Minnesotan is just starting his basketball journey by representing a newly recognized country. A former Matamidae and Concordia St. Paul basketball player was on South Sudan's national team, which almost upset Team USA this summer. Ren Clayton finds out about that moment and the impact the team had on its home country. Nuni Amat and South Sudan. A shocker at the O2 Arena. Nearly pulled off a world-shaking upset of the USA before the Olympics. The excitement and joy that was here in the country was, was unbelievable. The videos and, you know, people that called me and showed me everything that was going on. It was it was crazy because, you know, obviously this the sport has unified a whole country uh, after so much that the country's been through. Omat is a refugee from then Sudan and grew up in Minnesota, only starting organized basketball as a junior at Matamidai High School. The work that I had to put in was a lot different than a lot of other people just because, you know, I had to pretty much play catch up. Omat's hoop dream took him to Concordia St. Paul, then a top junior college and finished at Baylor, then a globetrotting pro career and recently, the moment that had USA basketball terrified. South Sudan led for the majority and came up one point short of a gargantuan win. Score for the lead! You know, it was amazing. You know, obviously uh, the US is the best team in the world, but you know, just to show the world that, you know, we can compete with them, uh, it just shows that, you know, the level is not that far off. That game and their Olympic run was galvanizing back home. Amat left amid an endless civil war, and about a decade ago, a new nation was born. The terror and violence that this country has been through has been, you know, something that, you know, has scarred several people. And just to be able to have, you know, this basketball uh, unite us and bring us as one and just, you know, obviously uplift the country. Amat is still chasing that NBA dream, though nothing comes close to the real world difference he's already made. It's just a blessing. You know, obviously there's things that I haven't done yet as far as playing in the NBA, but the impact that I've had, you know, on, on my on my people and on this country has, you know, it's something that can't be taken away from me. Ren Clayton, WCCO Sports. Good luck to Omad as he chases his NBA dreams. We're past the Minnesota State Fair, but we wanted to take a moment to highlight some of the special moments where people from across the state got a chance to celebrate and share their cultures. WCCL's Mackenzie Lofgren shows us what went down. Everything is more fun at the fair, and this is a wonderful day to be welcoming new citizens to the United States of America. And I am honored to be here. This is hands down the best part of my job, and this merges two of my all-time favorite things, mini donuts and naturalization ceremony. New foods, new rides, and Wednesday, new citizens. This is a remarkable day. All 30 of you are poised to take 
your oaths and become citizens of the United States. For the second year in a row, immigrants from more than a dozen different countries took their final step in the naturalization process on the state fair stage. Citizenship is very precious. Now between two ceremonies, more than 50 immigrants became U.S. citizens here at the International Bazaar stage. While it's not a traditional ceremony, some say it's more fitting. What do you think about this Indigenous Peoples Day at the fair? And I was like, I'm for it, right? And they're like, do you see more Native people during Indigenous Peoples Day? I was like, yes. Yes, you do. And they're like, what's it like? I was like, it's awesome because Indigenous people are amazing. What's the message with the song? You know, it's the drums, maybe people can't completely understand, but is there a theme behind the, the beat, the music? Well, each song has a different meaning, and you sing the appropriate song for the appropriate situation. So what does it mean, maybe, making that uh, debut, so to speak? It's huge. It's huge for, for our group. It's huge for our families. It's huge for our community. I had a lot of friends and uh, people from the community asking what time will we be singing, where will we be. They wanted to come specifically today to be here for this Indigenous Peoples Day. Well, it just makes me feel like home because Minnesota is pretty much one of the biggest states that have the Hmong population. We are a diaspora community, and so our community, we don't have like a home country. And so these events really bring us all together. What a fun fair. Can't wait to see you all there next year. Head to youtube.com slash WCCO and click on playlists for more stories giving voice to diverse communities. I'm Rich Chapman. Thanks for joining us for Voices.